Hello, and thank you for tuning into Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, the Chair of the Division of Clinical Microbiology in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. With me today is Dr. Bill Maurice, the Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic and the President of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. This is our weekly discussion with Dr. Maurice in which we learn about updates in the field of laboratory medicine and pathology. Bill, welcome back. Great to talk to you again. Yeah, here we are for another week. Here we are. So um, you've been traveling, um, and I understand that you just got back from Washington, D.C., uh, talking to administration about some of the challenges that the laboratory uh, community is facing. Uh, what have you been hearing besides COVID? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so yeah, actually, uh, Bobby, I was in Washington, D.C. for the annual meeting of the American Clinical Laboratory Association, for which I have the privilege of being the chair of the board. And so that's, that's a, uh, it was our first face-to-face -face meeting since March of 2020, where we were out there as the pandemic, uh, the national emergency was being declared and we had to visit the White House and all those things. So yeah, it was our first face-to-face. -face. That's a meeting where we talk a lot about what's happening at the federal level with laboratories. And so there was a lot of talk this year about moving past COVID. What are some of the issues we saw pre-COVID that are now coming back? And one of the big ones that's catching a lot of people's attention is the potential FDA oversight of laboratory developed tests. And there's a lot of discussion around that. And what is that? Is that the right move? And, and just a lot of dialogue there. You know, let's talk about that. It's such a big issue in the laboratory community. It's going to impact anyone working in the lab. And we've been hearing about it for a long time, but now it sounds like maybe there's some uh, increase in the pace in which this is going to be uh, examined. So. You know, I guess I'll take a step back and introduce just for the audience. I know we've talked about ACLA before, but the American Clinical Laboratory uh, Association. There, yep. sorry. So I know we've talked about this before, uh, but ACLA is the American Clinical Laboratory Association. So you're the president. Um, and do you want to talk a little bit about the yeah. background of so the website? Sure. It, it's uh, it, so just so people know, that's a trade association. So it has mm -hmm. other. Uh, that I sit on the board and chair the board, and it has other CEOs from other diagnostic companies. And it is, again, where the, there's a lot of discussion around policy and what's happening with policy in DC. And it's funny, because when I first showed up, it was like, I knew that not only Mayo Clinic is a good producer of word soup and acronym soup, because mm -hmm. clearly mm -hmm. the federal government, I think, takes a cake on that. And before we even dive into the details of the issue, one of the things is if I had to go back and say, what is, how are labs overseen at the federal level, right? Because mm -hmm. I think even that's confusing because we already have CLIA and there was a big thing. Well, what about CLIA? Well, CLIA, the, the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment or Act, I think it is, which mm -hmm. was introduced in the 70s, is administered by CMS, CMS. The Center for yeah. Medicare and Medicaid, um, which is under Health and Human Services. Um, which is a separate agency completely from FDA, right? And CLIA really is focused on how the labs operate because CMS is very much interested in clinical care delivery and clinical operations. So FDA is completely, it's a separate agency from CMS. And FDA is the one that is saying that as tests are manufactured or are produced um, to be introduced into healthcare, that they need to be overseen by the FDA as an agency that looks into the safety and efficacy of things that are used in clinical care, in particular devices, right? Then are these devices, which we would argue they're not. So it's really important for people to understand that there's really two significant agencies in the federal government, which have oversight of labs, the ones that we're used to, which is CMS, the one that we're not, which is FDA. FDA argues that they've had their, uh, the ability to oversee labs, since the 60s, but they've enforced regulatory discretion. There's mm -hmm. even debate around that. But it is, it makes it really confusing for people to understand um, why it isn't clear enough. And so these agencies do talk to each other. One thing that's been pretty clear is that there is no interest from CMS about telling the Congress that they need to change CLIA. So that means that if this whole idea around lab developed tests and their oversight CMS doesn't want to do it, which then leaves it open for us to work with FDA on what that's going to look like. 
Yeah, I think that's an important point too, Bill, because CMS, the branch of the government, uh, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, um, if they say they don't want to regulate tests, such as laboratory developed tests, LDTs, then it's kind of hard to turn around and say that they should do that. Um, I think you'd be facing an uphill battle, whereas you have the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, that wants to regulate tests, already regulates tests, and says in um, relation to laboratory developed tests that type of specific test that they've already had uh, regulatory ability, they've just used discretion in regulating them. Well, it kind of seems like that's where it's pointing towards with the FDA wanting to do it, CMS not wanting to regulate LDTs, and FDA saying that they already feel like they have that jurisdiction. And it's interesting, you know, we talk about lab developed tests, and they've gotten more complex since that was first initially discussed. Uh, you know, lab developed tests for our listeners are basically any type of in vitro diagnostic test that is supposed to be designed, manufactured, and used within a single laboratory. But we know with reference labs that they could sometimes be used quite broadly. So it's a complicated issue. It is. And I think, you know, just kind of go, to go back to your point, there has been some of our professional societies that our listeners might belong to that have said all along, we should be going to Congress and saying this should be you know, in CLIA, I think there is an a, there is an, a, a legislative um, uh, proposal to, to make that happen. But mm-hmm. the reality is that the way that this works between Congress and all these agencies is that Congress basically defines the authorities that these agencies have. Then they have to work within those boundaries. So if CMS isn't going to Congress and saying, hey, we want to take this on to your point, it's really not going to happen. As much as we might say from our professional mm-hmm. societies, or department chairs or you know institutional leaders really that's that the way congress works is that the agents they're not going to give something to an agency when they're not asking for it whereas fda claims that they it's actually in their purview meaning it doesn't even have to go to congress that they could just they already come have out it. and say this yeah. is how they already have it the the concern i think is of course that there we don't want to stop innovation from happening there's all these things mm-hmm. that there's the intent is almost always good Let's make sure the tests that, that we make in the labs are safe for patients. I think there's something all of us, no one would argue with that. Most of us would argue we do that already. Sure. Um, but then the question is, is it better just to have FDA come out with rules about how we do it? Or is it better to have it go through Congress where it will get debated? There'll be open sessions with different committees, the Health Committee in Senate, uh, the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee in, uh, in, in the House. So that provides opportunities for places like Mayo Clinic, uh, myself, yourself, you know, you other stakeholders go in front of Congress and say, well, here's how we think this should work or not work. It makes it much more of a dynamic process. So that's really yeah. all the nuts and bolts of it that I didn't know when I took this job, that's for sure. Yeah, I've been learning about it a lot too. And um, as my role as a, a governor on the Board of Governors for the College of American Pathologists, and you know, obviously lots of discussions have been going on at many different organizations. So to go to Congress to ask them to amend the law, which is CLIA, would really open up CLIA to all sorts of scrutiny, which some may be good, some may be bad. Um, you know, and CLIA has been amended multiple times. It was first passed in 1967, but then there was the 1988 and one in 1992. And, um, you know, there's a the question of do you really want to open that up again? That could be quite complicated versus the other path, which is regulation under the FDA, which, as you said, already claims they have it. So the two laws, of course, that we've been talking about for our listeners that really take two different approaches, these are two, uh, I should say, acts that have been proposed are called valid and vital. Yes. And it's easy to confuse them. Talk about, you know, all these acronyms, and then you have these names that sound so similar. Um, vital is the one that is um, was proposed It's a bill, and it would expressly shift the regulation of LDTs from FDA to CMS, whereas valid, its purpose would be to amend um, basically the the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act to provide for the regulation of in vitro tests, like to really spell it out and say FDA clearly has oversight of LDTs. So they really are kind of, well, they're completely separate in their approaches for regulation of LDTs. Yep. And the reality is, is that the vital act just won't have any support for the reason we just talked about. Right. So so because it gets back to why does all this matter? And I think it matters because it's really important for us as laboratory professionals to understand what's going on. 
because actually we have more influence maybe than we realize. Um, and so if a ballot goes through and the advantage of a ballot and, and that act being debated is that it will go to Congress, which means that if you are a laboratorian, you can find out who your congressperson is mm -hmm. and you can reach out and say, can I talk to you? You can send a letter. Those things have, uh, they have staffers that help prepare them for these issues and they will be, um, they, they, they will be receptive, particularly if it happens to be someone in your district or your state actually sits on one of these committees where the things really get hammered out. So understanding that and being not being afraid to have a voice, just feel like this is going to happen, is actually the worst possible thing. It's really important mm -hmm. that us as laboratorians reach out. But obviously, I'm doing that now in my role in ACLA. But it's really important that you understand and reach out, and and, and because they're relying on their constituents, especially in an election year, to help them understand these issues, right? So I think that's key. And the other course is CMS. One reason they're not too worried about regulating lab developed tests is because they're all over PAMA because they're the mm -hmm. ones that set the reimbursement rates for Medicare and Medicaid. So that's where if we get back to the, the PAMA issue, that's where CMS becomes really important and understanding that what's happening with that. So whole another set of issues, but it can be confusing. And I thought it might just be interesting for our listeners to understand how these things operate in, in the federal government uh, so we can understand what we're hearing and more importantly, understand where we might want to exert some some influence, uh, you know, locally to help with some of these things. And well, even think, something as yeah. simple as saying, I'm sorry, uh, you know, one thing we've asked about for, for LD from the FDA is that if you do this, can this please be the standard of the land? Because many of us have to work then with different state agencies, which have their own criteria, as a, for instance, some things that you could ask for. Sorry. Yeah. Bob. Oh, that's okay. I was just going to say, I agree with your point that laboratorians, uh, pathologists, other laboratory professionals, we have a voice, we should use it. It's best to be at the table. It does look like um, there may be opportunities and possible legislation uh, that would be coming up. Now is the time for us to be at the table really talking about what's important. And when it comes down to LDTs, these laboratory developed tests, well, it's important to remember that a lot of important diseases are uh, diagnosed in part, or at least the diagnosis is supported by the use of these LDTs. So yes. we want high quality. And I think in general, we have it, although there are sometimes, you know, some opportunities for enforcement of uh, and, and increased quality, but we don't want to just take them away. You know, they're very important and they need to be used as part of our healthcare options. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, two things I would add to that, I agree completely. Number one, if there was ever a time where you reaching out to a representative um, is going to and saying you're from the lab is going to catch your attention, it's now, right, with COVID. So there's certainly visibility. And the other piece of it is that what, again, what people really need to understand is what does this mean for patients, right? So, and if you can be, and, and no one can say that, tell that story better than us, right? And you talk about even some of the things that we do to modify FDA approved tests are lots so that they can run in a community lab so that they're available to our patients, right? Um, what happens to, uh, if we can't do a test for, for a pathogen, right? And someone can't. So I, those are the stories that, I mean, because that ultimately is really what the, is difficult in DC is everything becomes so policy oriented and so big picture oriented, but what really strikes at home, drives things home is the impact it will have on individual patients. Mm -hmm. And so the more that we can give that rich context as laboratory professionals, um, the better we are, we'll be just in general in our profession, but in this instance, in terms of making sure that things that happen in DC don't just happen to us, but to the greatest extent possible with us. With us, yes. Well, there's a call to action there. So yes. we'll all have to think about how we can contribute. Great Thank talking you. with you, Bill. That's a lot of important points for today. So I'm sure it'll come up again in a future talk, um, along with COVID, but it's nice to take a break from COVID, isn't it? Yeah, I know it's, it's the days when talking about the, the arcania of the federal government is a break from those things. <laughs> it's something I never expected, but uh, no, I think it's really important for people to understand. So yeah. thank you for bringing it up. Absolutely, talk to you again next week. Sounds great. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday. <laughs>